Who are the criminals that come up with the most devious plans? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, Maria Maria. Maria Christina Johnson was arrested for using her looks to rip off people she met on dating sites or house rentals. The interesting thing about Johnson isn't just that she's a scammer, it's the effort she puts into it. Johnson's been scamming people as far back as 1996 and has used different aliases for her scams. She's gone by Maria Hendricks, Gia Hendricks, Maria Christina Gia, and Maria Henka. Seems she really loves being called Maria. Johnson's scams often followed the same pattern. She would either date or rent from her victims to get access to their homes. After gaining this access, she would dig up personal information, use the information to open lines of credit, and spend all that money on herself. After stealing the identity of her victim, Johnson would live it up, charging thousands of dollars in expenses to the credit card of the person whose identity she'd stolen. And Johnson was brave with it too. Johnson clearly enjoyed the lifestyle it gave her and has stolen tons of identities. She's posed as a modeling agency manager, a member of NASCAR's Hendrick Motorsports team, and strangely, also as a dog trainer. By the time the police arrested her at a luxury resort, she'd already stolen over $250,000 from the latest victim. It's crazy that she got away with her scam for so long, but unless there's a bad fight or other suspicions, people typically trust the person they're dating the most. Number five, stolen property. Daniel Kennisberg had his land stolen by a scammer who impersonated him and passed his power of attorney over to a lawyer. Kennisberg had inherited the land from his mother back in 2007. It was originally a one acre plot and his parents had used half of it to build their home while leaving the other half untouched. A few years after he inherited it, Kennisberg decided to sell the home and planned to pass on the other half acre to his children. But in the meantime, someone impersonating him gave his power of attorney to a lawyer who sold the property on his behalf. The solicitor authorized legal documents, passed on those documents to a real estate firm, and the firm began building on the half acre that belonged to Kennisburg. The real estate firm was a company called 51 Sky Top Partners, and they purchased the land for $350,000. Kennisburg had absolutely no idea what was going on. In fact, he would have been left clueless for an even longer time if a friend hadn't called him to tell him that a fellow friend had mentioned a property being built on his land. At first, Kennisberg didn't believe it. He drove down to the place himself and was shocked when he saw that a structure was already being built on his land. The real estate firm building the house had already put plans in motion to sell the home once they finished building it. Kennisberg immediately contacted his own lawyer to find out what happened. It was his lawyer who revealed the fraud and told him that someone had impersonated him and authorized the sale. Further investigation revealed that the fraud had originated in South Africa where someone had made a fake passport for Kennisberg with an incorrect birthday, photo, and address. It was this fake passport that was used to authenticate his fake identity and to appoint a Connecticut lawyer, Anthony Manelli, as power of attorney. Once this person appointed Manelli, the scammer had him sell the land on his behalf. Manelli made the sale and passed the profits to the fraudster without knowing that he'd just been duped. After the real estate company discovered that they'd been scammed, they stopped work on the site. They told the media that they had no idea that the land hadn't been properly purchased and they had no contact whatsoever with the fraudster who sold it. In any case, Kennisberg decided to sue both the lawyer and the construction company. In the suit, he asked for the building to be removed from his land and had the property to be returned to him. It's unfortunate for the lawyer and construction company since they got scammed too, believing everything they were doing was above board. Number four, deeply faked. Debbie Shelton Moore was fooled by AI scammers who used artificial intelligence to impersonate her 22-year-old daughter's voice. The call lasted for approximately six minutes, and the whole time Debbie believed it was her daughter speaking to her. The scammer, who pretended to be her daughter, said that she'd been kidnapped and demanded money for her release. At first, Debbie believed that her daughter had been in a crash of some sort and was simply asking for help. She only realized that it was a kidnapping when she heard three male voices who told her that her daughter had been kidnapped and they needed $50,000. Then Debbie heard her daughter crying in the background. 
The crying was enough for her to fall for the scam and believe that her daughter was in grave danger. Debbie was even more concerned when she checked her daughter's phone location and saw that she was stalled on a highway. That sort of confirmed the fake call she'd gotten because the kidnapper said she was at the back of their truck. Fortunately, the scammers didn't get what they came for. Debbie's husband, who worked in cybersecurity, overheard the conversation and suspected foul play. He FaceTimed his daughter and confirmed that she was in fact safe. With her daughter confirmed that she wasn't kidnapped, Debbie could finally calm down and see what the ruse for what it was, a cheap attempt at scamming her. She reported the case to the police and made even further checks to confirm that her daughter was definitely not kidnapped. The scammers that tried to fool Debbie and extort her are part of a growing trend of AI voice scammers in the United States. These so-called imposter scams, where scammers impersonate people in order to steal money, are very popular. They've caused Americans to lose 2.6 billion dollars in 2022 alone and that number seems to be rising one way to fight these scams is for people to have safe phrases that they can use to authenticate communication with close friends and family members that way you'll know that a request for help is probably a scam when whomever that's trying to scam you doesn't know the safe word or phrase number three scamming nasa as crazy as this sounds, Sapa Profiles Incorporated unbelievably sold fake aluminum to NASA for 19 years. They were only discovered after an inquiry revealed they had caused NASA to lose millions of dollars worth of scientific equipment. NASA is staffed with some of the smartest people in the world, so you would ordinarily expect it to be difficult to scam them. But Sapa Profiles Incorporated did it by selling NASA garbage aluminum while forging certification documents to prove that it was standard quality. Sapa profiles would have continued getting away with the scam too if some of their garbage aluminum sheets weren't found on two rockets carrying satellite to space. The aluminum that was on protective shields that were supposed to detach from the rockets as they approached space. However, the shields failed to detach because they weren't the right quality, leaving the rocket too heavy to reach orbit. Since the rocket couldn't reach orbit, it failed and fell apart as it came back down to Earth. It happened twice and led to millions of dollars in equipment equipment getting destroyed. This catastrophic failure led to NASA to open an inquiry into why the rockets failed, and they discovered that they had been carrying substandard aluminum sheets. Further investigation revealed that the bad sheets came from SAPA profiles. Investigators discovered that SAPA profiles had been forging quality test results for over 19 years. The company had forged over 6,000 quality control tests in total. Employees of the company who tried to raise an alarm about the tests were ignored and pushed aside. One technician testified that he got daily requests for fake results and he did that by either passing materials that had failed the test or entering fake values into the report directly. Surprisingly, NASA wasn't the only company affected. 450 of the company's other clients suffered the same fate and their fraudulence led to millions of dollars in losses combined. As a result of these failures, SAPA profiles faced civil and criminal litigation. Dennis Balius, the company's lab test manager, pled guilty to all charges and was sentenced to three years in prison. Sapa Profile's parent company, Norse Hydro, was forced to pay around $46 million in reparations to both the U.S. government and other customers. But even that didn't make a dent in the total losses that the company's fraud caused its clients. It's pretty wild that this company got away with scamming NASA for almost 20 years, and you can't really fault NASA for getting scammed since Sapa Profiles Incorporated was a pretty reputable company. Just goes to show that even big companies need to be double-checked. And if you really think about it, the lab test manager most likely was just the fall guy, and someone higher up was telling him to make the fake test results. Number two, congrats, you're married. A Hong Kong woman, whose name wasn't released, was tricked into a scam marriage where she got married to a stranger. The woman had merely wanted to learn makeup artistry online and had gone on Facebook to search for apprenticeship opportunities. However, the company that she applied to convinced her to not learn makeup but event planning. So the woman took this advice and went for a week of training on event planning in Hong Kong. After the training, she was told she needed to participate in a fake wedding to complete her training. But there was one caveat. This fake wedding would take place in mainland China. So the woman decided to go to the wedding since it was part of her training course. When she got there, she was dressed as a bride and participated in the wedding. She was also told to sign real wedding certificates by the company. They told her that the wedding would be canceled shortly after the ceremony. 
However, when she returned to Hong Kong, she realized that she'd been tricked. The wedding was not canceled, and she had gotten married. She reported the case to the police, but they couldn't do anything since there was no evidence that a crime occurred. That was when she approached the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions for intervention. The union revealed that such scams were quite common, and about a thousand of them happen yearly. One reason why people perpetuate the scam is that people who get married to Hong Kong residents can enter the country legally and live there. It's most likely that the victim's fake husband, whom she doesn't even know, has entered Hong Kong with the marriage certificate. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how this poor girl had to helplessly watch herself get scammed in real time after her wallet was stolen at the gym. Number one, accounts held hostage. Kathy Kitterzinski lost her Instagram account to hackers after spending over $150,000 and countless hours building her business's brand. And all of that happened without her clicking even one dodgy link. The entire saga began when Kathy, who had 44,000 followers on Instagram at the time, decided to get the elusive blue tick. There were several accounts pretending to be hers doing fake giveaways, so she wanted the blue tick to authenticate her account. However, that plan back fired when she was texted by a page pretending to be Instagram's official page. The page looked real and it had 800 million followers. There were also a lot of important brands following the page. But that should have been Kathy's red flag since no account has even 700 million followers on Instagram. The most followed Instagram page currently is still Instagram itself with roughly 656 million followers. The scam page didn't send her any link. It just told her that she'd been given a blue tick and she needed to log out of her page and log back in to access it. Kathy believed all of this was normal procedure, so she did as she was told. She logged out of her account, but when she tried logging in, she was alerted that a third party app was trying to log in as well from an untrusted location. She immediately tried to log them out, but they had already gotten in and changed the language from English to Turkish. Before she could translate the language to do anything, they had logged her out and switched on two-factor authentication. Kathy thought she had two-factor authentication activated, but even that couldn't save her. Within a few minutes, they had taken over her account. She reported the case to Meta, but the company didn't reach out. The only ones that reached out were the scammers. They told her to pay $400 for her account, but Kathy didn't want to. She knew that the account was probably worth more to them than $400, and that the first $400 would merely be a way for them to extort more money from her. So instead of paying, she ignored them and stopped replying to their messages. They kept on texting that they would delete her page if she didn't reply, but she remained steadfast. In the end, the scammers made good on their promise and deleted the page. But that wasn't the end of the story, because Kathy somehow managed to get her page back without paying the hackers. It was a smart thing that she refused to pay them that initial $400, because they probably would have used it to funnel even more money from her. Life was looking good for Charlotte Morgan. She had been offered a new job and had just finished talking to a coworker about her future plans when she went to her local gym for her evening workout on Wednesday, August 24th, at Virgin Active Gym in Chiswick Park, London. It wasn't until 9.30 p.m. when she finished exercising and went to the locker room to get her things that her nightmare began. She discovered that the padlock she used on her locker was gone and her backpack had been stolen. Certain that nobody would have been able to figure out the code to unlock the padlock, she was convinced that somebody must have used wire cutters. However, how could a person get away with doing something like that in the open? Charlotte was about to find out that the security systems that the gym had in place were no match for a sophisticated thief. All of Charlotte's most valuable possessions were inside of her backpack. It was where she kept her cell phone, bank card, house keys, and bike lock keys, all of which were now in the thief's possession. Without her cell phone, she had no way of calling the police or reaching out to a friend or family member for help. She rushed to the front desk, where two other members stood looking concerned. They entered the gym at the same time she did, and she found out that one of them had their belongings stolen too. Another odd thing that happened when they went to check in earlier that night was that the electronic entry system was down, so they had to write their names on a piece of paper instead. With the gym not being as secure as it would typically be, her fear turned to her stolen bank card. She had to jump through many hoops to get her bank account frozen. The staff at Virgin Active refused to let her use their phone or computer, claiming it went against their security policy. Eventually, a colleague came to her aid and let her use their phone. Before she could find out if there were any unauthorized charges to her account, the call handler forced her to answer a series of security questions to confirm her identity. Once her identity was approved, she was given the long list of transactions charged to her card. Between her starting her workout and calling Satlander's hotline, thousands of pounds had been spent. 
Suddenly, she was helplessly watching her money be spent in real time. The first transaction was just after 8 p.m. at the Apple Store in Westfield Shopping Centre, located in West London, where they spent £3,000. At around 9 p.m., they moved on to a second Apple Store on Regent Street, spending around £1,000. The last transaction was at Selfridges, where an initial £750 was charged. By the time they were able to put the hold on the account, the stores had already closed for the night. If the gym let her access her information on their computer, then she would have been able to stop the thief sooner. Santander should have noticed that the purchases being made on her card weren't normal. In fact, they were completely different from her regular spending pattern. She had never shopped at an Apple store before, let alone been to two other stores on the same night. Also, she would rarely spend a lot of money at once. She knew that there were supposed to be protections in place to stop this from happening. Shocked, she asked why the bank didn't try to stop these transactions. It turned out that texts querying the purchases were sent to her stolen phone. If she had her phone, then she would have immediately been able to stop this from happening. Instead, because the fraudster had her phone, it was easy for him to approve every single transaction and continue their shopping spree. All the while, Charlotte was left frantically trying to figure out what to do. Hoping that she reached the bank in time to stop anything else from being charged to her account, she was horrified when the call handler informed her that there was an additional pending charge of £3,000 to her account. She was watching herself getting scammed in real time. The criminal spent more money on their shopping spree than Charlotte had in her entire account. Already upset that the text checking for fraudulent payments went to her stolen phone, she didn't understand why her account didn't overdraw. It should have never been possible for so much damage to be done to her account. The Santander call handler told her that money was transferred from her savings account in increments of £2,500. Her life savings were in that savings account and could have helped her stay afloat while she waited for the rest of the charges that night to be reimbursed. Not only did someone have her bank card, but they also managed to access her entire account at Santander. Left in shock, Charlotte found herself stranded at the gym that night. The keys to unlock her bike were gone, her house keys were stolen, and she couldn't call for an Uber or reach out to her landlord without her phone. It wasn't possible to get a hotel without any money, so Charlotte resorted to spending the night at her office where she was a TV producer. She sat at her desk all night as she researched what had happened to her and tried to figure out how she would get her money and possessions back. In the morning, she contacted her landlord and he gave her a new key to her house. Then began the excruciating wait for answers. Police told her when she filed her initial report that they would get back to her in a few weeks once they reviewed the security footage and Santander said they would investigate the case too. Unfortunately, a few days after the initial incident happened, there was a long weekend that delayed the answers she desperately needed. The anticipation was so grueling that she could barely eat or sleep. Virgin Active UK refused to take responsibility for what happened, stating that they never take fault for theft. They claimed that the turnstiles were in the middle of a quick reboot when Charlotte checked in that night, which was the reason why a member of the staff was writing down people's names as they entered. Members of Virgin Active Gym in Chiswick Park were also never told about the theft, even though another woman had her things stolen that night too. But turning off the turnstiles and just writing names is still breaking protocol for security anyways. Santander took it a step further and even blamed Charlotte for the situation. She was accused of either writing the PIN number on her bank card or writing it out on a piece of paper that she kept in her bag. They went as far as saying that she must have shared the number with colleagues, friends, or a family member before they told her that she wouldn't be reimbursed for the transactions charged to her account. There was no proof that her negligence caused what happened, but the fact that her PIN was used meant that Santander refused to accept the blame. She took to Twitter to share her story. She detailed the entire ordeal in a series of tweets from the card entry system not working that night to Virgin and Santana refusing to accept fault. Tens of thousands of people shared the tweets and she received a flood of responses. Local firemen offered to free her still locked bike and a nearby restaurant offered her a gift card for a free dinner. A member of Virgin Active in Chiswick Park wrote a reply where she questioned if it was safe for her to keep going there. People also sent her links to places where she could report Santander and Virgin Active UK for mishandling the entire situation. A bank security expert confirmed that the most likely thing that happened was that the thief took the SIM card out of her phone. Charlotte had so many unanswered questions. How did the thief know getting into the gym was going to be so easy? How could they have hacked her padlock? How were they then able to bypass her phone's facial recognition and passcode to gain access to her phone? How did they figure out her bank card's PIN code? How were they able to change her bank details so easily? Our question is, were they a member of the gym and just decided to do the crime since they could get in easily?
Santander insisted that Charlotte was at fault and that her money was lost due to her own negligence. But a Twitter user helped Charlotte piece together one likely explanation. All the thief needed to change her bank security passwords and PIN was her bank card and the SIM card from her phone. Once they had that, they just needed to move the SIM card from Charlotte's phone into their own, where it would then bypass needing the thumbprint security or facial recognition that it would need on Charlotte's phone. However, Santander claimed that it would depend on how a user logged into the app on their phone and that they wouldn't be able to get into it without a passcode or using biometrics to obtain the PIN. They also clarified that the in-app PIN resets are common for UK banking apps and not a feature unique to Santander. A few days after Charlotte's tweets, Santander had a change of heart. The bank called her and agreed to reimburse her for the fraudulent charges. They gave Charlotte a long apology and admitted that they handled the situation poorly and were ultimately at fault. If her story didn't go viral, would Santander have given the money back? Or were they doing it just because they basically were guilt-tripped into it? Following Santander's lead, Virgin Active UK also acknowledged their role in the incident. They admitted to Twitter user at Viva Jinsu that their security machine was broken when she entered and that the staff didn't even bother checking people's memberships before letting them through. Virgin Active UK also claimed that they would do whatever it takes to win back Charlotte's trust, but it might be too late. Charlotte confessed to losing all of her trust in banks and gyms. Now, she always locks her SIM card with a PIN number and separates her bank card from her phone. She was still paying off her phone when it was stolen and, as expected, she's still being held responsible for the rest of the payments, as she didn't have any phone insurance. Unfortunately for Charlotte, she still has 20 monthly payments left beginning in October of 2022. These types of simple gym thefts have apparently been becoming more common in locker rooms in London. Many people have already contacted Charlotte to say they had a similar experience after her story went viral. Charlotte's now actively advocating for change and wants to see police, gyms, and banks working together to stop anyone else from going through the same experience as her. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section on a sliding scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being no trust and 10 being completely trustworthy, how much do you trust the government in general?